Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Leveraging Social Media to Win the War for Talent webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature which is located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Thursday, May 30th, 2013. I would now like to turn the conference over to Erin Jacobson. Please go ahead. Hello, and thank you all for joining today's webinar, Leveraging Social Media to Win the War for Talent. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. By the end of the day tomorrow, you will receive an email from us which will include today's webinar slides, recording, and information containing HRCI credits. This information will also be available at ERE.net. We have had an overwhelming response on this topic, but before I get to it, I'd like to say a quick thank you to JobBite for sponsoring today's webinar. I'd like to introduce Jackie from JobBite, who would like to take a few minutes of your time before we kick off the webinar. Hi, I'm Jackie, Head of Recruiting for JobVite. We're proud to be sponsoring today's webinar, and I'd like to thank Jenny from Randstad SourceRight and Brett from Prudential Financial for their time. As a senior recruiting professional, I'm really looking forward to today's re uh, presentation. JobVite is a recruiting automation platform. We are only focused on recruiting. JobVite provides tools and solutions for social open web sourcing and search, talent pool management and collaboration, campaign management and job marketing, full social referral tracking, all the way through the hiring process with deep applicant tracking, workflow management, dynamic interview scheduling, and company branding with hosted career websites. At JobVite, we believe and provide the tools to make every employee part of the hiring and branding process. JobVite powers many of the who's who in corporate hiring and talent pool sourcing, from high tech to energy all the way to healthcare, we cater to multiple industries and recruiting processes. We spend a lot of time with our customers like Twitter, Zappos, LinkedIn, and many more to drive our products to be all that they are. Thank you again for letting JobVite sponsor today's webinar. Thank you, Jackie. We are very lucky to have Jenny and Brett speaking today. Jenny is the Senior Director of Employer Branding and Social Media for Randstad SourceRight. Brett is the Director of Recruiting Programs at Prudential Financial. She oversees the Digital Employment Recruitment, Branding, and Marketing Strategy to position Prudential as one of the top employers in the marketplace. Welcome Jenny and Brett. I'll turn this over to you. Hi everyone. This is Brett, and thank you for that, for that introduction. So as mentioned, I have overall accountability for our digital employment branding efforts on print and digital. So that includes all of our social media properties and career sites. I'm also um, proud to be a member of the LinkedIn Expert Advisors Group and also LinkedIn 100. And basically um, what we do in these groups is we talk about ideas. Um, ideas and concepts that LinkedIn presents to us. We provide feedback, we provide more ideas, and it turns into a really great um, brainstorming um, between our LinkedIn partners and then other members um, of those groups. And we, I got some really great ideas from uh, participating in those groups. I'm also um, on an active research working group with the conference board, and we are, um, our goal is to publish a playbook for other companies that they can leverage when they're kicking off their social media strategy. So that's been a really interesting project. Um, on a personal note, um, I'm married and I have two kids, a boy and a girl, and um, I'm an avid amateur triathlete and foodie. And I say uh, amateur because I participated in my first sprint triathlon uh, two summers ago, my first Olympic last summer. And, um, and then I also love to eat. I love to try new foods. I like to go to restaurants. I love wine tasting. So as you can imagine, um, these two passions don't always complement each other, but you know, it, it's all about balancing, so it's all good. All right. Thanks, Brett. My name is Jenny Devon. I am the Senior Director, Center of Expertise in Employment Branding and Social Media for Ronstad SourceRight. 
and I am consistently on LinkedIn's top most connected women in the world. I have over 28,000 first level connections. So if you're not connected to me, please send me an invite so we can do that. I used to lead all the social media for waste management, and that included talent acquisition, our customer outreach, marketing, and employee engagement for that global Fortune 500 company. In my free time, I like to um, go to NASCAR races and also spend time with my children. But I'm really pleased to be a part of this webinar today with Brett. I wanted to show you some statistics that Jobvite had provided, and we really appreciate them sponsoring this webinar. Um, the top sites for recruitment. So if you haven't seen this slide, I always find it very interesting to see what companies are using uh, for recruitment. And last year, LinkedIn was the winner. I don't think that surprised any of us followed by Facebook, then Twitter. And what kind of surprised me though, um, from a search engine optimization perspective or SEO perspective, was that only 20% and 19% of companies are using Google Plus and YouTube respectively, despite their impact on search. So though most of us would agree that um, the war for talent begins at search, meaning what candidates enter in to Google, Yahoo, or Bing to try to find opportunities with your companies, um, some of us are not spending time in Google Plus or YouTube to impact that. But Brett and I are thrilled to be able to share some examples with you on how we were able to effectively use social media to recruit talent. It really starts with the comprehensive social media strategy. So I was able to partner with Brett um, when I worked at HODAS at Prudential, and she was always focused on social media strategy. And we don't have the time, unfortunately, or resources to maintain a social media presence without a strategy. This slide really refers to how unproductive your efforts can be in social media to win the war for talent if you don't have a strategy. And now Brett will discuss our first lesson learned. Thanks, Jenny. So um, lesson number one, and this was a huge one for us at Prudential, that when you're preparing for your social media strategy and implement implementation, it is critical to gain buying and support from multiple stakeholders. So, you know, given especially um, for those of you that, that are in um, financial services, you know, we're, we're in a pretty heavily regulated environment. And it was really important that the first, first off that we gained executive sponsorship. So, you know, in the beginning, I would say that um, the head of staffing and head, head of HR um, were huge proponents of being live in this space. And I want to call out, too, that in the beginning, it's not like we had this ample budget. It was really budget on a shoestring. We, you know, leveraged our own recruiters um, and staffing members to be on project teams. And, um, you know, many are involved today in helping me manage the properties. As we gain momentum, however, I will, will say, that um, we did have, have to um, invest in a social media uh, recruitment community manager to help us manage our content strategy across our multiple platforms that we have now. But to begin, we didn't do that. We realized after um, building momentum that, that that was important. We needed that skill set, and it was you know, something that we need that could fill somebody's job alone. So um, I digress for a moment, but in any case, getting back to um, getting buy-in and support from multiple, multiple stakeholders. I will say that it's really important to put a lot of thought and preparation into what your business case is going to be. You know, for us, um, what really helped us here is that we looked at other players in our space, other financial services firms, and we saw what we looked at what they were doing, um, what social media neighborhoods they were active in. We tried to see what their success was like, what their followership was in. And, um, and also I will say, you know, we, we obviously complete for us with other companies for talent. So we looked at a number of companies. And then what we would do is we would, you know, sort of show this data to important stakeholders. And actually we were proving that if we didn't have a space or a place in this game, we were going to lose. We were going to lose our comp a competitive edge in getting the best talent for the company. So I would say that that was, that was really critical for us. Um, I would also say that we had plenty of stakeholders that had skin in the game that we really need to influence and gain buy-in from. So, you know, a few of them I'd mention, and you probably have some similar functions in your organization, are groups like our global communications group, um, legal, HR technology, 
um, you know, global advertising, corporate compliance, HR compliance, risk, our, our social media committee, there are so many players that we needed to get aligned with us. And I would say one thing that really helped us, and you may have heard this, time be, this term before, is it was important to have a meeting before the meeting. So, you know, we went, we really, you know, invested and spent the time and talked about our ideas and shared our business case individually with all these stakeholders. And while we were doing that, we were getting their feedback, we were getting their input, and we were incorporating it into our plan so that by the time we were ready to meet as a larger group, these members were already aligned with us and started becoming proponents for some of, for some of our ideas. The, the, a lot of time was spent on demonstrating how are we going to mi mitigate risk to our brand? How are we going to you know, mitigate um, any risk that might har harm the Prudential brand? Because we knew that we were going to be accountable for every different kind of scenario that, that might happen. And, and specifically, you know, this is back in 2011 when we were, when we were preparing to go interactive on Facebook. So um, in order to help us, we spent a lot of time, and again, these were existing team members and then also other um, partners from other groups that were quite instrumental in helping us here in the company, all internal, again, internal consultants. And um, you know, we developed solid standard operating and escalation procedure manuals. We have five of them in total. Um, we have one on maintenance. What are we doing to keep the site fresh? We have one on monitoring. You know, what are we doing to, um, to monitor the site, see what the activity is, you know, who's monitoring, what's the schedule, and by the way, how are we going to monitor off hours uh, during weekends and during holidays as well? We had to develop a really robust escalation tree and process. We have a manual around publishing content so that we make sure that we're keeping our content fresh and that we have a, um, you know, a solid content strategy and a calendar as well. We have guidelines around user admin access and security, you know, who's allowed access, who's not, what do we do when someone leaves, how do we ensure security and integrity of the site, and then finally, we had to develop training decks for our team. So we actually developed roles, secondary roles, for mostly our recruiters on becoming community managers. So I have two community managers, one primary, one secondary, who you know, basically are assigned different days that they're creating content, posting content, and monitoring the site. I, for example, am a first point of escalation. So I can get a call at any time in the middle of the night, and it hasn't happened often, but it has happened. Um, I will share with you that really an aha moment for me um, in going through this process is that you really need to position your, um, your initiative as, as a series of reviews. I think at first we were looking for approval, and then we realized that we were the key stakeholder and had ultimate accountability for our site, that this was a business-driven or you know, function-driven initiative and that we were really the only ones that could give ourselves approval, but yet we wanted to be careful. So we made sure that when we were meeting with all these important stakeholders that we, you know, positioned as, you know, the meetings that we were going to review our standard operating procedures, our plan, our strategy. And by the way, launch date is on X. It was never positioned if we launch. It was always when. So that's sort of an important um, mind shift when you're looking to, um, to launch something. Um, in your company, and then and then finally, I'll um, I'll end with you know this this concept around, around building bridges. So, you know, it was important for me to gain a seat at the table with really who are my closest partners today, and these are partners in my global communications function, in my e business development group, and also my advertising group. I work closely with these partners in developing my strategy, in developing my content, creative everything, and, and I have to tell you, in the beginning, there were bumps because I really had to earn a seat at the table with these folks because really, in the past, they were more accustomed to working with people from the business. So it was important that I, you know, in my team, I spoke in business terms, I spoke about return on investment, and I had solid um, branding concepts and metrics in place because really, when you think about it, how businesses measure their success and activity, those concepts are transferable to how we measure employment branding activity. And we'll take questions at the end, by the way, so there, there will be time for that. So um, lesson number two, 
meet as a social media council to discuss initiatives with key decision makers. So this is really a continuation of what I was just talking about. And, and one thing that really helped get everyone on the same page and align is um, for each social media platform, we always had a project team. And what we did for each team is we developed an oversight committee. The oversight committee was our, our governing party, uh, and they were part of the project team. So that they consisted of again of this key, of these key stakeholders that we knew had skin in the game that you know were responsible for mitigating risk to the company externally. So we made sure that they were on our oversight committee, and really their um, their remit or responsibility was to be present when we provided reviews at critical milestones. That they provide us feedback that we can incorporate into the strategy, and equally important, if we had had run into any obstacles, that they would help us navigate and manage through those obstacles in the right way. So what's really important about developing this governance structure is that by getting these key stakeholders aligned in the beginning, there then you know obstacles that could have happened later were, pre pre were prevented because we brought these folks on early on in helping us uh, launch our initiative. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jenny to talk a little bit more about the Social Media Council. Yeah, so at Waste Management, I had an incredible executive sponsor. So Lynn Brown organized our first face-to-face -face social media council meeting. And we were really starting from scratch. We had um, gone on Facebook and Twitter, but really not developed these properties and not leverage everything we had at Waste Management. So she set up our first meeting. She made sure it was face-to-face. -face. It included IT, talent acquisition, communications, customer care, marketing leaders within our organization, and also our agency partner at the time was in attendance. And so we were able to move important projects forward like creating our first corporate blog. So most companies had already created one years ago, um, and this is something that we knew was important to our branding and our thought leadership in the space of sustainability. And so she actually helped form this council, and we were able to move things forward that would have taken months of emails and conference calls and things. We were able to make decisions quickly because those decision makers were in attendance. And eventually our social media council meetings became you know, less than an hour long meeting every single month to move these projects forward. And we could also share ideas and resources which save money and time. Um, so this approach really helped us out um, at Waste Management. It's definitely one that I would recommend. And lesson number three is decide which platforms support your recruitment goals. So we're getting some questions in regarding you know, what channel we're most active on and what channel we use for brand maintenance versus brand drivers, which is really important. Um, and we find that you know, it's so important um, to win the war for talent on the right platforms. And you have to use the recruiting tools or social media platforms that work best for you. You can't simply choose them because your competition does or because that's the way you've always recruited. Um, there has to be compelling reasons and data that support why you want to go out on these specific platforms. So first of all, you really need to find out where your ideal candidates are. And you can't make assumptions. A lot of people just assume everyone's in a particular platform or not. And they're really not looking at different skill levels. Maybe they're just looking at titles only. Really do your homework up front. And also determine what resources are available to contribute content to join those talent pools. So even if you're, you know that your um, candidates, for example, are in specific LinkedIn groups, what content do you have available to share? Um, who's going to write this content? Who's going to deliver it? Um, at Waste Management, I had an excellent partner, Alex Brown in Talent Acquisition, who was, a, who was a creative writer, and he could write and reposition content for us, but not everyone has those internal resources. And you also need to define what metrics and KPI you're going to review. Um, if you're not reviewing these metrics, if you're not sharing these metrics and KPI with your leadership, so that's a key performance indicator um, with your leadership, you can't really tell if you're doing well or not or what you need to improve. And so defining the metrics up front is really important when working with those specific platforms. And also let your leadership and colleagues know why you don't want to invest in social, so, social media sites. So for waste management, it was really myself leading the social media charge. I had Alex Brown in Talent Acquisition helping me. I had other resources in marketing uh, and IT helping me too. But it was really me on the front line you know, 
responding to over 20 million customers, over 40,000 employees with over 1,200 facilities in North America. So I really had to pick and choose where we were going to go out to try to attract talent, what platforms we were going to use because we didn't have very much time or resources available or a budget. And so I would always tell my uh, leadership and executive team why we weren't going to invest in a certain platform because it gave me more credibility into why we were going to invest time in certain platforms, and it also built more interest around that. Um, and then you know, I think too it really helped um, build their engagement into you know, my credibility that I wasn't the social media person that expected us to do everything, um, that we were going to have a strategy in place and um, use our time and resources wisely. And so, you know, Brett, I know you had to go through this um, at Prudential as well. So how did you decide which social media platforms were more imp most important for you to reach your talent acquisition goals at Prudential? Well, you know, Jenny, most of your, your points resonate with, with our approach and what we did. Um, I would add, though, that it's important to think about what your goals are depending on the platforms you're looking at. So, you know, for example, for us, was it, you know, was one platform more about branding, employment branding, and, and driving engagement, um, and um, the conversation and educating about the company, and you know, or was the platform more about, you know, um, directly, you know, sourcing sourcing people to hire. And I would say, you know, for us to give more concrete examples, I would say face our Facebook careers page is probably more about employment and branding. We're looking to drive engagement, educate, you know, get buzz um, out there about the company and then ultimately entice and drive drive these folks back to our career site. That's that's more branding and we look at different metrics there. Versus a LinkedIn, LinkedIn, we are very active on LinkedIn, you know, back going back to that slide you showed um, in the very beginning, it is one of our, our top three sources of hires, and we actively mine, pipeline, you know, seek passive talent um, on LinkedIn. So, um, so I think you know it, it, you have to be very clear. And one thing I've learned too is that you have to be really clear in educating your your stakeholders and business partners about this because, you know, if I could have a dime for every time I was asked. Um, were you making hires off this, you know, off of this platform? And I'd have to explain about, you know, sort of the difference between employment branding and having a presence, and sort of tracking other metrics, what we might call qualitative metrics, like, you know, what what type of comments are being um, out there, how are how you know how many people are sharing, how many thumbs up or likes are we getting, for example, um, versus you know direct hires. We're actively, you know, tracking that, you know, for for LinkedIn. Um, I think it's also really important. Again, you know, I'll go back to my point about what are our, you know what are our competitors doing as well, and what's what's working for them, what's not working. Um, and then, you know, I really like your last point about um, this concept about around giving yourself permission to be innovative. And you know, in 2013, we created an innovation budget, and it's not a lot of money. It might be about thirty thousand dollars. And this budget gives us permission to try new things because, as you know. Um, there are a lot of players and different platforms coming up on the scene, and it doesn't make sense to be everywhere. I 100% I agree with you on that. But you know, every once in a while, there is a platform up there that we're watching and we're thinking about it, and you know, we're still being thoughtful, but yet, yet it's a risk. So you know, for one one example for us is that we're really watching Pinterest, for example. You know, that might be a place that we might um, might be testing next. Um, I would also say that. Um, when you're thinking about sort of um, you know what would complement your social media strategies, um, video sharing is huge. It's exploding in the marketplace, so I think it's really important to have some sort of platform. I, mean, I know YouTube is the largest one where you can share your videos anywhere, anytime, any place, and they're all you know, and you're also able to do that from all your social media um, properties. So, so you know, I would say that 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 was probably our our latest launch, our um, YouTube Careers channel. When um, you know when we're thinking about where it makes sense to have a presence. Good points, really good points. And so, just to ask, um, answer a couple of questions I think are relevant right now. So, um, a question regarding how did you decide which KPI metrics to use? Really, it focused on your goals. So, at Ron said source right because we're an RPO. Um, our metrics are all in our service level agreements. It's all around time to fill, source of hire. Um, sometimes they're around diversity requirements and things of that nature. Um, you know, how old is the rack, the aging racks, things like that. So 
Um, we are always trying to find hires faster, more efficiently, and more effectively than other sources. And so those are some of the KPI metrics that we look at um, in addition to reach and brand and whatnot. And when we say platform, it's really, um, you know, we, us in social media, Brett and I have been talking social media, I want to say for at least four years together now. And so a lot of times instead of saying social media website or social media network, um, you know, we'll say social media platform. So it's just another word um, for social media that we like to use. And when you look at this slide, this is a slide from Ron said source rights, uh, source of hire. And our operations team and sourcing center of expertise are, uh, the sourcing center of expertise, excuse me, is led by Glenn Cathy, but our operations team also helps impact these scores. And we saw a significant increase in social media for direct sourcing and hires for our clients with positions in North America last year. So though we recruit and source globally for our clients, this is just from North America alone. And as you can see, the numbers are pretty astounding. You know, 418% increase in Facebook. 350% increase in Twitter, almost a 200% increase in LinkedIn, and we expect these trends to just continue. Now Brett's going to talk a little bit about mobile. Yes, thanks Jenny. Lesson number four, go mobile. I can't stress that enough. Mobile is social. Mobile will only elevate and promote engagement across your social media sites. I think we're all, you know, probably familiar with research seeing how mobile eventually is going to be overtaking, you know, desktop. Um, you know, some latest research I, I saw in, in one study was that 77% uh, of job seekers or, or, you know, passive or active, they want to be able to hear about career opportunities through their mobile device. They want to search and share jobs on the go. Um, and in that same vein, most access their social media accounts through their mobile device as well. So um, we knew that this was important. You know, we launched a mobile site in 2011. And um, we, we did it in phases. We knew that it couldn't be, you know, a complete comprehensive site as we have today. So really our mobile site is a, um, it's a, it's sort of a microcosm or snapshot of our desktop site with the option to, you know, um, learn more and go to our site as well. Um, we have videos on the site as well, and recently, sort of, you know, with this sort of prioritization we have here in the second bullet, you know, we knew we sort of wanted to get out there first, and then the second phase was actually um, adding our jobs, building the platforms that you could actually, you know, search our jobs on your mobile platform too. So that was optimized as well, so that you know, job seekers can search and share jobs on the go. They can send reminders to themselves. And um, you know, not quite applied yet unless they're on an iPad. Otherwise, it's a bit cumbersome. But that's sort of the next phase of what we're looking at. How can we make that process, you know, efficient and easy? And you know, I can tell you um, two different um, individuals I know that have been hired at the director level both found their jobs at Prudential by commuting to their other jobs and searching on their mobile device. So those are two sort of you know individual case examples. And you know, there there are definitely more. Um, later this year, we're looking to um, do a complete discovery and refresh of our mobile and desktop sites. We're very focused on keeping the sites bold, innovative, and fresh. We know the career site is a huge um, you know, footprint in representing our employment brands. We pay, pay close attention to this and, and you know, invest dollars there. So some of the things that we're looking at is we do want more um, connectivity and interactivity um, with with candidates around hiring activity. We want to be able to tell, you know, from a campus perspective when we're going to be a camp on campus, what events are coming up. We want people to be able to easily add these events to their calendar, things like that. Those are just a few examples. But um, again, we're, we will be doing a complete refresh to see what else we'll be doing. Um, one lesson learned for us is um, QR codes. I don't think anyone's really cracked the code there. I can tell you every piece of print collateral that we have, our business cards, they all have QR codes either to our mobile site or to our Facebook careers page. And uh, we've had a small response rate. You know, we have a call to action on everything, but that's something in a way we're still considering testing. So that hasn't be been as effective for us as we'd like it to be. And Jenny will talk a little bit more about that. Um, I also want to call out another lesson that was learned for us. For those of you that 
are active in managing any search engine optimization campaigns on um, search engines such as Google. We've learned that when we look at our budget for our job, job ad work campaign that we have to actually allocate dollars to mobile, that they're different budgets. So words that we're optimizing thinking that you know, they're going to be up on um, you know, mobile and desktop platforms, it, it's, it's not the case. So that's, that was a lesson learned for us that we need to make sure that we're also optimizing um, and creating campaigns for our optimized site. Mobile, uh, Jenny, how do you think mobile impacts social? Oh, you know me. I mean, I've been um, going to the mobile recruiting camps since uh, Michael Morley started them, and and you and I are both friends with Chris Hoyt, who's just done amazing things in mobile. Um, so, you know, I think if you have a social strategy that doesn't include mobile, it's lacking um, because we don't go anywhere without our phones. I, it amazes me every time I go to the airport, every go any of that. Every we're all sitting on our phones constantly, and so if people do not recognize the impact today, um, you know, I think you're going to be behind. And when you look at a company like Prudential, the coolest thing is that even though, again, highly regulated financial industry, because of someone like Brett, who's very modest, um, in the recent I Momentous corporate mobile readiness report that they put out, Prudential was ranked number 7 out of all Fortune 500 companies. So Prudential is absolutely a forerunner, front runner in mobile. And they're not using this excuse. You don't hear Brett say, well, we're highly regulated, so we can't do this, or we can't do this, or we can't do that. She gets it done. She, if she has to create books on how to escalate things and guides on what to do when things go wrong or when things need to be escalated, you know, she's done that. And so I just kudos to Prudential because um, they are a front runner in mobile and not limited by um, their industry. When we look at mobile, though, there are some limitations. And this example, shows how technology doesn't always positively impact the candidate experience. So a lot of times you'll hear me speak about candidate experience. I'm on the Candies Council, um, the award that's given out for candidate experience to employers. This is a billboard on a highway. And I pass one like this when I drive from Atlanta to Charlotte. And although I love the Air Force Reserve, if you know anything about me, I'm very passionate about our military and veterans and very appreciative of the sacrifices that they make. Um, this QR code just isn't effective, and it's potentially unsafe. You know, when I worked at Waste Management, uh, safety was our number one priority. I would never have put QR codes on the back of our trucks. Um, we would never have put QR codes in places where it could be potentially unsafe for someone to scan it. So um, although this may be a way for the company to show they're innovative, um, it doesn't actually work um, in, in the real world. And so sometimes these these examples that we see with use QR codes or use this or that are really not thought out. Like how would the candidate really use it? What, how is the candidate going to actually scan this? Um, and what type of candidate would drive down the road and scan this? Is that somebody we actually want to hire? When I look at mobile and social things that I think are going to work better in the future, it's really the social and mobile integration. So it's how people are using social media sites on their phones. And so how can we make it easier for a candidate to apply? Some of the things that Brett talked about, you know, having an e easier application process. So this one is from Twitter. And recently um, they have a lead generation feature that they offer. And here in a tweet, a candidate can send the employer his or her email address for this opportunity by pressing or clicking the Connect button. So this makes it easier for the candidate to show immediate interest. And you don't have to do a public apply or anything like that. And in this way, the employer can follow up with that candidate directly. Lesson number five, focus on the recruiter's individual social media contribution. This was a huge lesson for us here at Prudential because um, you, know, you know that saying, build it and they will come? Well, that, that certainly wasn't the case for for us here, I think. Um, whether I'm talking large scale from a branding effort or tools that we, we're giving um, our recruiters. And you know, I have to say, um, I think that the shift we've seen in recruiting and branding, it's been a huge change management process, you know, a huge change for recruiters in how they're looking for talent. You know, so I'll give you an example, right? In 2007, we here at Prudential had 117 job boards, right? That seems kind of excessive, doesn't it? Now we're down to six, six job boards. We have been shifting our investments from you know, um, job boards to social media. 
And that doesn't mean we've been increasing our investment. We have been keeping our investment flat as well as we've been, you know, shifting from job boards. And I'll also add that when we weren't expecting this, but this was a delightful surprise, that we actually are seeing a cost save from this shift as well. So, um, so it's, it's been interesting. And, you know, we found that, you know, um, so for example, for, you know, on an individual level, and then just to level set, we do have key performing indicators and metrics for, at a higher level for all of our platforms that we realized that we needed to support and encourage recruiter adoption as well. And the example I'm going to give is um, LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is a huge um, source for us. We've seen linkages to um, quality of hire um, over time with, um, with getting and seeking passive candidates on LinkedIn. And we realized that we needed to do more to support them. So one thing that we did was we developed a scorecard. And I have to say that, you know, I had internal partners happening, ha helping me here at staffing. We have a measures team. And then we collaborated and really worked closely with some fantastic partners at LinkedIn. Our relationship managers and product managers were in the thick of it with us helping us develop this scorecard because we would look at our metrics and then we'd have them look at our recruiter activity um, on LinkedIn as well. So to give you an idea of what we did, we developed targets around in-mail sent, in-mail response rate, profiles viewed, um, you know, number of interviews, number of hires, and there's probably a few others we looked at as well. And we started holding, we launched in 2012, and we started holding monthly meetings. And what was a really big decision for us was we decided that we would be very transparent in the process to really help us learn from challenges and then also just to leverage learnings. And that when we have these meetings, um, the recruiters can see each other's progress. It's basically an Excel sort of, um, you know, format with our recruiters' names and the targets that they're measured against, and you can see sort of, you know, who's doing well um, one month, and those, you know, targets are marked green, and maybe some are at a different cycle of recruiting, maybe they're slower, maybe they're having some challenges, and, you know, those targets would be red. And we would talk about what's working, and, you know, some recruiters would really be doing really well, and they would share with us, um, you know, what they were doing, they would share in-mail templates or, or, you know, different tricks, and, you know, I have to say that I've been learning a tremendous amount through these, meet, through these meetings. And, you know, when there's challenges, we talk about that too, and it's very collegial. It's, it's not finger-pointing at all. It's, it's not about that. You know, it's similar when you think about it to a sales organization. Sales organizations operate in the same way. And also, you know, we really wanted to promote a, a sense of, like, healthy competition as well. We, we wanted to sort of demystify this, be transparent, and I have to say that the results have been um, quite astounding. Um, we have seen a 600% increase in hires from LinkedIn from 2011 to 2012. So if I break this down for you, I would say that, you know, 11 of hires came from LinkedIn in 2011, and we're up to about 80 in 2012. And for in 2013, the numbers are like, it looks like we might even double that in, um, in 2013. So that has been, um, you know, um, definitely a journey in learning and, and testing, and, you know, we keep adding. So this year we, um, we actually added a best practices slash demo component of it where recruiters at the beginning said to us, you know, we get so much hearing from everyone, let's just build that into the structure. So now recruiters rotate um, and sort of showcase or spotlight a best practice or something that's working for them, and then we'll dive into the scorecard. Um, it's also important that as you implement new tools, we're building upon the, sort, the scorecard. You know, last year we called it sort of our LinkedIn source, um, scorecard. Now we're calling it our sourcing scorecard because we recently had all our recruiters, um, you know, AIRS Diversity 8.0 um, certified. And so we wanted to help them promote and promote adoption of all the great things they learned there. So we added some targets around the use of you know, um, complex search strings so that, again, you know, we're seeing how they're doing. We're seeing the return on that investment and, um, you know, helping them, um, you know, helping the, the learning stick, if you will. This is just an example of one of our recruiters, how um, many of them sort of promote themselves um, on LinkedIn. 
All right. Lesson number six. Uh, each job description impacts your employee value proposition. If you don't know what an employee value proposition or an EVP is, it's, real, it's really all the reasons or the benefits why an employee chooses to work for your organization. And it's really important that you define this up front because these benefits are a reflection of your company's culture. Top talent wants to know what it's like to work at your company. Uh, they listen to feedback from their peers, and you should leverage your unique EVP to make genuine connections with talent that is a cultural fit. And so when you interview employees that are high performing, and you create these key messages and the employee value proposition, and then you create shareable collateral. So you create videos, photos, rich content to maximize the emotional impact of what it's like to work at your organization. You can utilize those assets in social media, and then you can also update your current recruitment marketing job templates. So if you are using Monster.com, you can embed those videos and really reflect the values that your organization has. So Brett, I know this was a daunting task for you at Prudential. How did you create your employment brand at Prudential to attract top talent? Well, you know, I, I think it's still an evolution for us, Jenny. And, you know, I agree with a lot, you know, again, with a lot of your points resonate with things that we, we are trying to implement here. And, and I will add on to two different things um, to this list that I think are helping us. And one is that we linked our employment brand to the company brand and to the company-wide um, branding campaign, which is called Bring Your Challenges. And we made the conscious decision, and it was, you know, at that time it felt like a big risk to sunset our employment brand, which was Rock Your Career. And you know, one of the reasons we did this is because we knew from, from research that we saw on what makes a strong employment brand. It's those that leverage the power of the company brand and the consumer brand. And, we, you know, and also you know, intuitively, the Bring Your Challenges campaign works really nicely and fits with, um, you know, with career as well, with career focus. Um, another angle I'd like to quickly um, touch on, and I see here you have um, a screenshot of our, um, you know, our, our channel on YouTube, is we're also experimenting and taking a different approach with videos. So we, we also believe strongly um, in the, you know, employee testimonials and our employees telling the stories. And now we're, what we're doing is we're sort of focusing on this, what we're calling a how-to series. So and it's, it, and it's a bit more subtle branding, a bit more authentic, more organic, and really here what we're trying to do is um, provide value to passive and active job seekers. And wh another reason we did this was because you know when um, you know you go on YouTube, for example, you know most people go to YouTube to learn about anything and everything, and that they also get you know the most play. And I learned that from internal consultants here that were guiding us when we were um, developing our video strategy. So the video that you see here is called Work It, and it's all about how to build your professional brand. It's, it's, it's short, it's funny, it's meant to engage you, it's meant to hopefully um, you know, um, encourage watching the whole video as well to limit sort of you know, premature bounce rates. And our second video on this, in this series that we're um, getting ready to launch is called Get It Right. Which is, um, which is about how to navigate a corporate culture. So it, it fits well in the social media community. You know, it's light branding, it's subtle, but yet you know, it also is a different way for people to have Prudential, you know, have them keep top, Prudential top of mind for them. Absolutely. I think you know, some key lessons learned there is just by uniting and being parallel or in tandem with the consumer brand and the talent acquisition brand, so many more good ideas and resources can be leveraged from that. Um, but when you go to Prudential Careers and you look at one of these videos, it's so engaging and it's really helpful for the job seeker. And it also has kind of a lighthearted, humorous perspective as well, again, from a company in the financial industry that normally wouldn't put this out. So kudos to you again, Brett, for that. Um, when we look at lesson number seven, and this is our last lesson um, before we'll take questions again, please put your questions in the chat room and we'll you know, take as many questions we can with the time we have available. But some companies still block employees from having access access to social media sites. 
And it always makes me wonder, you know, if your employees are your best assets, people always say, people are our best assets. Well, if that's true, why not let them represent you online? So, you know, one lesson we learned is that you really need to encourage employees to discuss their professional highlights in social media. Um, so many people want to keep their personal life private. They don't know how to interweave their professional life. Some of us, when we started in social media, had two Facebook accounts. That goes against Facebook's regulations on using the platform. Um, so you know, candidates are more likely to believe a peer rather than a recruiter or you know, the information on a career website. So it's essential that you educate your employees, number one, on the potential, both positive and negative, for using social media. But you can just start simply with one employee story. So at Waste Management, we had several, several thousand employees or drivers that we could leverage their stories. And we started with one female driver, um, our diversity coordinator, Yen, and Alex Brown partnered together and created an amazing piece that was integrated into a women in trucking publication. And then we used it for all of our social media platforms and used the photo, the stories, um, you know, again, changed the lingo and the um, length of the story depending upon the social network we were using. It really helped promote a larger diversity initiative that we had at Waste Management. And it also helped reflect our diversity of thought. And we continue to highlight different levels of leadership. So we had different spaces like our waste management blog and different places where we could show candidates um, you know, more insight to our company's culture and really give candidates a way of seeing how our employees are valued and using our employees' voices and perspectives and ideas and maybe even um, industry expertise to attract more talent. And so um, you know, a great example at Waste Management that I just wanted to highlight um, was Alex Brown. So his Twitter handle is the underscore Alex Brown with Waste Management Careers. And this is an example of how to use Twitter to really connect your personal interests with your professional aspirations. So Alex leads all of social media for talent acquisition and college recruitment at Waste Management. And his account reflects the corporate brand and so do some of his tweets. But occasionally he tweets about his personal life and the content is appropriate. I always say, is it something you would share in front of the C-suite? If it's not, you probably shouldn't tweet it. So you can find ways to use social media networks to reflect your personal interests and your professional goals to show your company's work-life balance because this is very attractive to top talent. Um, they want to know that you have a good work-life balance. They don't want to see everything's related to work, 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 work. But they also want to see you know you as a person and get to know you as well. And so we hope you've enjoyed hearing some of the lessons we've learned. You know, Brett and I have learned a lot of lessons. That's not all of them, <laughs> and we continue to learn every day using social media to attract top talent. Um, but we'd love to turn it back to ERE for questions. Um, with the time that we have remaining. And again, the webinar and the recording, the slides, everything will be available on ERE.net um, for those of you that may join late or want to share it with a colleague. Okay, let's start with some questions. Erin, did you want to leave the questions or should I just take it? Go for it. Why don't you okay. just take it? All right. Let's do it. Thanks again, ERE. We, we really appreciate it. And to Jobvite. All right, so um, I found this question to be really interesting, and, and Brad, I think you're the best person to um, answer this. So what social media channels are you most active on? Which are more brand maintenance versus brand drivers? Hmm. So I would say that um, from probably a sourcing recruiting perspective, we are most active on LinkedIn. And from a branding perspective, we are most active on Facebook. We just launched YouTube in November, so it's still early days for us there. But the second part of that question, Jenny, was around maintenance over drivers. Right. I mean, I'll tell you for me what's, what's been a, a real um, lesson learned here is that building that engagement and presence and expanding our social media footprint is a slow build. Again, again, that, that saying, you know, build it and they will come, I mean, it's, it's not the case. You need to do a lot of nurturing. You need to be patient. 
Um, so I don't know if I can say yet that I, I feel like I'm in a place where it's, it's driving yet. I think that that's, that's aspirational, that we would, we would want to be there, you know, and that, you know, the metrics are telling us, um, you know, that, that, we are, that we are headed there. I would agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, and a lot of it is what goals you're obtaining. And so I think for us, you know, most of, my, most of the focus on what I do at Ron Fitz Source Rate, we are about direct hires. We are looking for hires. We're not necessarily looking to brand the company or, um, you know, help their employment brand in a way where that's our number one goal. It could be a goal to differentiate them versus a competitor, but we're actually looking at everything tied to hire, so your normal HR metrics are really driving what platforms we participate on. Um, another question is regarding analytics. So I can definitely speak to this. What platforms are you using to manage the analytics of hit rates, origination points across social sites? Any type of conversion, any type of thing, those, that's so important to me to manage. Um, if I don't know what platforms are working right to get source of hire, and so you can look at a platform and say, you know, let's say we look at our career website and say, 80% of our traffic is coming from Facebook. Well, that might be great, but what if those hires are? All, what if that traffic is all unqualified candidates, and none of those are hires? Then we have a problem. Um, so we work really well with ATS and CRMs and and all the other technologies available um, in that hiring process to determine where the source of hires are truly coming from, not just the candidate self-selecting when they when they set up the application. Um, at waste management. I worked well with the IT team. We used Adobe Omniture. I also had access to Radiant 6. Um, direct employers would give us access to the Google Analytics platform on the site that we had, the microsite we had through them. A lot of the microsites like Talent Reef, um, SAP Success Factors, which used to be Jobs to Web, they have great analytics available on where you're, where you're really converting to hire. Because um, that's the most important point. Because if you get traffic metrics, that doesn't necessarily tell you where the good candidates are coming from because they could be coming from one smaller source, not necessarily the one that receives the most traffic. That makes sense. Uh, Brett, we had a question. If you could share your recruiting source card, I don't know if that's proprietary to Prudential. Would you be willing to share that? You know, I, I, I am pretty, pretty open about sharing our tools. If you want to contact me offline, I have a template that I share, and, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about things that we're doing offline. And, um, and you know, obviously I want to learn from others on this call too. I'm sure that people on this call are doing some great things I'd love to hear about. So um, if you contact me offline, we can, we can certainly set something up. You know, you know Jenny, there's, there's one question here. What advice would you give a small startup company with low consumer and employment brand awareness? And if you don't mind, I'd like to comment on this question. Sure, so, go ahead. Okay. So um, I just want to say that in the beginning when you're getting started, it can seem daunting. And I, and I just want to say, you know, Jenny and I were having a conversation earlier, and I remember sitting on webinars and conferences listening to Jenny. I knew nothing. And, I, and she would speak, and I would take copious notes, and, you know, she, she still is the master to me. But I, I just felt like from attending these things and listening to Jenny, I got so many great tactical ideas and advice to get started. But, but one thing we're doing, and you might be doing this, is um, in, in 2013 we are focusing on our employees, and, and Jenny kind of alluded to this, as talent ambassadors and talent scouts, kind of giving them the tools, um, guidelines, and how they're going to convey our employee value proposition. So I think, again, like, you know, equipping your employees and sort of starting this, this movement is something that could be, you know, really, really impactful. Um, we're also looking at leveraging, um, you know, the power of social media networks for employee referrals as well. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do with your employees that, that might help boost, boost brand awareness. I know Jenny, do you have anything Brett. to add to that? Yeah. No, I, I think that's, that's good. And I also think um, here's a great question too for you, Brett, that I think you can answer. Um, you know, regarding your activity and return on time spent. So what level of positions are you finding success in attracting top talent from LinkedIn? And you had an over 600% increase in hires from LinkedIn. Just an amazing, memorable statistic. So could you talk about what levels of positions are you finding success in attracting top talent from LinkedIn? Yes, I can. I also want to um, 
you know, point out that it was also one of our top three sources of diverse, diverse hires as well. Um, but, you know, that was another lesson because we thought it was going to be mostly high-level, um, you know, roles, maybe director up or sort of your traditional financial services roles, and we didn't think we would find lower-level um, roles or roles that, um, you know, we have uh, plenty of uh, service centers or call centers. And um, it was, you know, an aha moment to us that actually um, LinkedIn was a top source for those roles. So we were really excited about that because we didn't know if it was going to sort of fit the need for, you know, those level of jobs, which, t which tend to be a bit lower. So um, we found that it's, that it's, it's every function, you know, um, all different levels. I mean, if we're going down to, you know, administrative assistance, you know, I, I haven't really seen anything there. But as far as all levels, all functions, you know, executive, regular, lower level, we're having success. Good. That's good to hear. I mean, and I think that that's, again, when you assume you're only going to get one thing or not, you, you might, because you're measuring those results and you're looking at it, you're finding success in other areas with other positions. Um, I love this question. How do you handle negative comments, responses to employee posts? Um, I dealt with this, you know, with many clients I work with at HODIS, also at Waste Management, and um, currently, you know, help consult clients of Ron said search right. And you're going to get negative responses and comments. Um, you're going to have people post things, and you're going to have po people post things that are true and untrue. But when it's online, um, everybody assumes what they read is, is truthful. And so when somebody goes to your Facebook page and writes horrific things about you as an employer, it hurts. It hurt my feelings. Um, you know, it was something that I dealt with on a daily basis, and I was the front lines at waste management to, to respond to them. So a lot of times um, what we would do is we would re really look at the position and see if it was valid. Was it a valid concern? Was it something that was truthful and valid? Did they really want an answer? Or did it really matter whatever we would say, no matter what we would say, um, that we wouldn't be able to help that person? So we really wanted to look at that and then decide if we were going to re respond publicly or not. 99% um, of the time we respond publicly, we would redirect them offline. So we would have them reach out um, to actually my email address and then I would put them in touch with the correct person in HR. So again, having that social media counsel, setting those things up front, having the escalation plan like Brett talked about, knowing what you're going to do when things go wrong in social because they're going to. They will. And so I knew exactly what to do with that post. I'd reach out to my colleagues in HR, and they would handle the concern offline. The main reason we pulled it offline was because of our privacy concerns for our candidates and our employees. We couldn't prove if that person was actually the person they said they were. We couldn't tell if it maybe was a spouse or someone else. You know, we didn't want to share private employee information online, and we were very deliberate in that. That was in our About page. We set it occasionally on the wall for people to understand. We wanted to help our employees. We wanted to help people that used to work for us that may have negative feedback and comments for us, um, but we didn't want to share those things publicly because we wanted to make sure we were you know, really in line with the privacy issues and their privacy rights, even if they were allowing us to talk about it publicly. Um, Brett, how, did you how do you handle negative comments about Prudential from employees online? You know, it's interesting as I listen to you speak, Jenny, because you know, we're in different industries, but our, our approach is, um, is almost identical. Um, you know, we, you know, I, I will say, knock on wood, we've only had about three escalations that we were able to mitigate effectively. But we, we kind of handle it in the same way. We try to be transparent. We try to respond directly. And we also try to take things offline. Um, if there's something that's spam, that's derogatory, you know, that is something that we would remove. But, but to your point, we also have a page on our Facebook page that talks about sort of you know, some guidelines and operating principles and when we would, you know, what our etiquette is and when we would remove something. And if we remove something, you know, we would also, you know, talk, you know, explain why we were doing it. So, um, you know, we would deal with it in, in a very similar fashion. Great. Well, I think we're out of time today for today's webinar. But again, Brett and I completely appreciate everyone that's participated, all the tweets that have come through. And also, here's our contact information. Um, both, of, both Brett and I both love connecting with people offline and being a part of a community that shares experiences and learns from best practices. So feel free to reach out to us both, either via LinkedIn connection or email. And you can also check out our websites. And I know Prudential is hiring, and so is Ron said source right. Um, but we really appreciate Jobvite sponsoring the webinar and ERE inviting us to present together. 
Great. Thanks. Good job, you guys. Uh, just Thank a quick you. reminder that by the end of the day tomorrow, you'll receive an email that will include today's webinar slides, recording, and information containing HRCI credits. This information will also be available at ERE.net. A big thanks to Jenny and Brett for sharing with our audience today, and a huge thank you for, to JobVite for sponsoring today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line.